guest lecture is uh, related to this day because, you know, today is the International Day of Light and we wanted to, of course, uh, have a, a talk about light and in particular about photonics. And so we decided to go to Pavia where uh, our next guest lecturer um, is an associate professor um, and uh, he is also a technical advisor at Xanadu Quantum Technology. So please welcome Marco, Professor Marco Liscidini. <clears throat> Thank you for the kind introduction and uh, thanks to the organizer for the kind invitation. It's super nice to be here for this wonderful event uh, in front of so, uh, tal so many talented physicists, the future of physics here. And so today we're going to talk about squeezing light for quantum technologies, okay? And uh, as Matteo said, today is the International Day of Light, so I thought this would have been uh, appropriate. Okay, so. Uh, this is the outline of this lecture. I will first uh, try to understand what are quantum technologies, okay, just to pin down what we are talking about. And then uh, I will talk about generation of squeeze light. We're going to talk about what squeeze light and how we generate squeeze light. Then we will see there are some problems in generating squeeze light. And so we are trying to understand whether there is light at the end of the tunnel. And then uh, I'm going to leave you with some take-home messages, but of course I didn't want to write take-home messages, so I said, okay, some spotlight, okay? So that we stay in the light theme, okay? So let's start with quantum technologies and what are quantum technologies? So we take the Oxford American Dictionary and we Google, and we, wait, we Google, or we, we, we watch technology, and this is what we find. So the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes, especially in industry. So what we are talking about today uh, is definitely physics. Some of this physics is actually related to foundation of physics, heavily theoretical physics, okay? But we are going to use it to solve practical problems. And uh, it's remarkable um, how quantum physics and foundation of physics gets very quickly into the realm of uh, application. And we have seen this uh, uh, before uh, in the talk of Federico Mattei about uh, IBM. Okay, so a concept like entanglement, which are really related to foundation of reality, are absolutely instrumental to develop a quantum computer. So, Let's give, you, let's give you some example about the kind of problems we are interested in. So the first class of problem is related to communication. And in particular, the idea of communication uh, in a way that is secure, or uh, for example, I want to communicate as much information as I can, okay? This is an important problem nowadays, and uh, we'll see that quantum mechanics can help in this respect. Another class of problems is related to computation and simulation. This is something uh, we have heard about this morning already by IBM. And here I show you uh, all these uh, container piled up because there are some problems, and this is the uh, is um, and this is one to represent the salement problem, okay, that cannot be solved efficiently. Okay, now it's not clear whether you can solve the salement problem. Uh, efficiently with a quantum computer, but certainly uh, the Salman problem, which is basically delivering a certain amount of uh, goods uh, between several kind of parties and, and find the, the most uh, efficient way to do that, is, a, is a, an example of problems that have a, a huge impact in the society, but at the same time, they're very challenging and uh, uh, at the moment have no solution. We're going to see that there are some other problems that probably quantum computing can help. Okay, for example, the chemistry of batteries, as um, uh, Federico, uh, Federico Matteo was saying, uh, or uh, um, the synthesizing uh, new molecules and new drugs. 
And the third kind of problems which uh, uh, are connected to quantum mechanics are related to metrology and sensing. And we have just heard before the coffee break about gravitational waves. This is actually a picture of a gravitational interferometer in Pisa. There is one in Italy, then there are two in the uh, in US and one in Japan. And, uh, and here the problem is that we have to measure a variation of distance of kilometers with a precision that is 10 to the minus 15 meters, which is uh, the radius of the proton. So you can understand that here the problem is not only to perform the measurement, but to have uh, enough signal to noise. Okay? And of course, you may say that this is fundamental research, yes. But uh, today, we are going to talk about how light can solve a practical problem to make this object work with a very good precision. Now, uh, all these, uh, uh, all these uh, kind of uh, problems now um, help to define a new kind of class uh, of problems that are related to quantum communication, quantum simulation and computation and quantum metrology. And there are thousands of scientists nowadays active in these areas. Now, these kind of uh, applications are very different. One thing is measuring gravitational wave. Another thing uh, is um, communicating. Nevertheless, they all have something in common. If you think about it, you have at the beginning a certain input. Okay, even in, in a measurement, you typically prepare um, a probe, okay, that have to investigate something, okay? Then uh, this input uh, is fed into something that uh, control and manipulate this input. In general, you have an evolution of this input. And then, of course, at the end of this evolution, you have an output, and you read the answer to your question. For example, this is pretty clear in computing, but the same can be applied to communication, and the same scheme can be applied to sensing. It's all about information, and it's all about quantum information, in this case, when you use quantum mechanics. So um, let's try to uh, understand what do we need to approach this kind of problems quantum mechanically. First of all, we need a system with quantum properties, okay? which usually we describe with a cat or a density matrix. right? And, uh, but this is not enough because we need to be able to control and program this system, because we want to encode, for example, the question we want to answer in the system, right? And, and then we need to be able to make this system evolve towards the answer, because this is what quantum computer does. And then, of course, at the end of the evolution, I have to be able to read and characterize my state. And you know very well that the only way that we know to characterize a quantum state is basically calculating expectation values. And this is what we do when we understand the quantum system. Okay, so let me give you some examples of the possible quantum system that we can use uh, in a number of applications. Okay, let's start with uh, atoms and ions. Why? Because this is the obvious choice, right? Because this is when you started doing physics and you started quantum mechanics, one of the first things you study is the hydrogen and atom. And in fact, atoms are so quantum in nature that most of quantum mechanics have been developed to describe atoms. These have been used, for example, in quantum computing. This was mentioned before. For example, in IonQ, this is a company, okay, it's not a research center, they trap ions in these kind of traps there. And you can see this uh, white uh, line there, it's the fluorescence of the atoms that are there. And this atom can be set in particular states, they interact with each other towards a certain evolution, and then I can go and read optically the states of the atoms. But uh, interestingly enough, you don't have to take one single atom, you can take many atoms together and construct material that exhibit uh, quantum properties at the macroscopic level. And you know, we're talking about superconductors. Superconductors are fascinating materials because uh, First, they are, they are known because they exhibit zero resistivity at sufficiently low temperature. 
But for example, they are very well known for this picture, when you have a magnet that levitates on them because a type 2 superconductor exhibit Meissner effect, so the magnetic field cannot enter them, and so the magnet floats, the superconductor is the black one, okay, not the magnet. And uh, they have been used, and this is the picture of the first uh, IBM, little quantum computer, the one that was talking before, uh, with four trasmons here, okay? And, uh, and this is uh, at the basis of, of IBM technology. But today, we're going to talk about a different system, which you know through equations. And this, of course, is Maxwell equations, right? And we know this is light. This is the light, how the physicists see light, okay? And I wrote this uh, using the auxiliary field, D and H, okay? Because, uh, because we are going to deal with light and matter. And when you deal with light and matter, the best approach is to use D and H, which are used to describe, in a simple way, the response of the matter, of the bounded charges of the matter to the electromagnetic interaction. And of course, you learn of these uh, not in quantum mechanics. At the beginning, you learn in classical electromagnetism, right? And uh, in classical electromagnetism, you learn this at the beginning of your bachelor. But then if you go on, you realize that this very same equation also holds in quantum electromagnetism, okay? And quantum electromagnetism, I like this picture because you can kind of recognize Beethoven there, right? Because there are many properties in quantum electromagnetism that comes directly from classical electromagnetism. So if you study very well classical electromagnetism, you, you learn an immense amount of tricks that you can still use when you quantize the field. Of course, the equations are written the same way, but now D, B, E, and H are not field anymore. They're field operators. I'm going to talk about raising and lowering operator. I'm going to talk uh, about expectation values. So the languages change, but still, we're talking about the same actual equations. Okay? Very well. So, so we want to light because light is quantum properties, but let me give you a couple of uh, reasons we want to use light. So the first reason is that light has many degrees of freedom. What's the degree of freedom? It's property. Okay, anytime I want to encode information in something, in a system, I encode it in one of these properties. And in light, I can use many degrees of freedom. If I have a photon, the photon has a polarization, so the direction of the electric field. It has an energy. It has an angular momentum. It can have angular momentum. Uh, it can have also a momentum, so the direction of propagation. Okay? And I can use all these degrees of freedom, alone or together, to encode an immense amount of information, as a matter of fact in principle, unlimited amount of information on a single one. Okay? This is not enough. Light is another important feature because uh, light has a very long quantum coherence time. What does it mean? It means that uh, uh, it exhibits quantum properties and uh, I can maintain these quantum properties in my system for a long time, actually almost indefinitely. You know, you have photons in uh, quantum state that travel galaxies, right? Now, this is very different compared to the previous system that we have seen before. In the superconductor circuits of IBM, the coherence time is typically on the order of milliseconds. And after a millisecond, your quantum information is gone. In ions, you can do better when you take one ion, you can do even hours of coherence time, but when you start to take many of them, the coherence time goes down significantly. So you have to be very fast in dealing with your quantum system. With light, no. You can be a lazy person. You have a lot of time to play with light. Okay? Another important point is that light propagates fast. You know that, right? And, and this is particularly useful for the class of problem related to communication. You're not going to send an ion to the United States to communicate quantum mechanically you're going to send light. It's the only possibility. Quantum communication, light, you know, it's plain easy. There's only one possible candidate to quantum communication, okay? And then the last of the interesting properties is that light is already compatible with an immense amount of the existing technology, 
Okay? And in fact, in the study of quantum information theory, light has been used extensively, much more than the other two candidates, because it's very easy to do quantum experiment with light. You, it, they can be done in a small university. Okay? You don't need to cool down your system at the millikelvin. Okay? You can do it room temperature. And not only, light is also compatible with existing quantum technology. Suppose I want to create a cluster a computer with uh, two IBM computers. I cannot send the quantum information outside uh, my cryostat without losing coherence. I cannot do that. I cannot bring a trasmon into the other computer. I have first to convert my information to, into a vector that can travel outside the viewer and re-enter in the other one. And that vector will be light. So light will be used to create cluster of quantum computing. Very good. So I give you a number of reasons. So let me give you some example in which we can use light for quantum technologies. So let's start with quantum communication. So uh, this is a very, very well-known example. So suppose that I want to communicate between two points, A and B, and people in quantum community say Alice, which pretty much everybody say choose Alice like this. 90% of the people always choose Alice like this. But then there is more freedom on Bob, and they choose Bob, okay? So, um, so Alice and Bob want to communicate. They're very far apart. They want to do it in a very secure way. And of course, uh, it would be fantastic if they have two keys identical to encode the message. The problem is that Bob forgot to give Alice the key, and then he moved on the other side of the planet. Oh, well, I could send the key, but someone could intercept the message, right? So I cannot do that, but in quantum mechanics, you can do that. You can create a, a source of non-classical light to entangle photons. I can send a photon to Alice, a photon to Bob. They can measure this photon, and they can construct these keys. And the information will be created there where they are. Now, interesting enough, there is no superluminal propagation of information because neither Bob or Alice have control on the outcome of their measurements. So Bob cannot decide what Alice is going to read. Nevertheless, we are going to violate local causality, and there is no problem with, with, with relativity here. We violate local causality, and this allows us to create quantum key distribution, was security, is based on the very fundamental law of physics. So if I want to hack this protocol, I have to hack physics, right? So as long as this is the description of the word we have, this will be secure. And this is a very interesting application, but it's not just in theory here. It has been done. And not just between two labs. It has been done between two points on Earth at the distance of a thousand kilometers using a satellite. This is clearly rocket science, right? Now, and this has been done in China in the group of Zhang Wei Pan uh, in 2020. And uh, they did quantum key distribution using non classical light. We're going to try to understand which kind of light. Okay? So it's reality, it can be done. Okay, next example. We talk about quantum computation and quantum simulation. I already talked about the Selman problem. Uh, we don't know how to solve that one, even, even with a quantum computer. But we know that there is a problem which is extremely difficult to solve. It is the following. Suppose you have an optical circuit, a linear optical circuit. Okay? You have n channel input, n channel output. And this circuit is just described any, any other linear optical element through a matrix, a transfer matrix. Okay? Now, it's interesting because if uh, I inject a certain type of non-classical light, classical light is easy, non-classical light in these circuits, and then on the other side, I don't measure intensity, but I have photon number solving detector, and uh, I try to, I can sample the number of photons that at the same time arrive out of each port, okay? This problem is called boson sampling, just because I am sampling, with the photon detector, bosons, photons in particular, okay? Now, it turns out that you can perform this experiment, but if you try to guess or calculate the probability of a certain output distribution for certain 
kind of non-classical light, this, this cannot be done classically in an efficient way. In an efficient way. Because, of course, any problem can be solved classically. The problem is that it cannot be solved efficiently. Let me give you an example. In 2020, again, Zhang Weipan in China, well, they perform this kind of experiment. It's called Gaussian Boson sampling. And uh, this is just a detail of the setup. You see some lights going around, some elements, vertical elements. These are just bin splitter and lenses and so on. I'm a theorist. I'm not an experimentalist, okay? And, uh, and they use this, uh, uh, they implement a circuit with one other channel, and they sample the distribution of photon exit from this one other channel. And to do that, they take about 200 seconds, okay? Now, imagine you want to calculate the results of their experiment using uh, this best, the best classical computer you have on Earth nowadays. Well, you can do that, but you have to wait a little bit. 2.5 billion years. So that's a long time. So that's why we say it cannot be done unless you can live 2.5 billion years, right? And for the records, at that time, even with a quantum, with the best quantum computer of IBM, which is a quantum computer, the quantum computer would have take 2.5 days to solve this problem. Obviously, better than 2.5 billion years, right? 2.5 days, though. Huh? So it's a tough problem. It has been done. And this is the first experiment in which people demonstrate quantum advantage with light in computation. So they show that there is something I can do with light that I cannot do classically. Okay? Very good. Now, that was a research center. But this is not just research. There are companies investing in light technologies for quantum computation. And I was very lucky because I've been involved uh, with Xanadu quantum technologies since the very beginning, uh, a few years ago, actually. Five, six years ago, they founded this company in, in uh, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And, uh, and just two years later, uh, two years after John Wei Pan, they uh, implemented a time version of this problem. So instead of having a physical channel, they have time channel, okay? And uh, they made available this computer, it should be still online, it's called Borealis, available to everybody in the world via cloud. And this computer is the first demonstration with light of quantum advantage, which is commercially available. Okay? And we'll talk about Xanadu a little bit also later. So, it's getting reality. So light can be used for quantum computation. And it's not obvious, guys, because uh, you know, light doesn't interact. At, photons do not interact with each other very efficiently. Okay, and we want to, when you want to do computing, you need interaction, no linearity. Okay, we'll talk about that. Okay, so last example, the last class, quantum metrology. We talk about quantum metrology. We talk about uh, gravitational wave detection. This is a picture of another interferometer. Is uh, the one in uh, uh, Louisiana, I guess, Livingston. It's a LIGO, it's one of the two LIGO. The other one is in the state of Washington. And um, uh, three years ago, so originally the first experiment to 2015 that was also mentioned before uh, the coffee break used light mm, to measure gravitational waves uh, using this interferometer, okay? Now, uh, in 2019, they upgrade this uh, interferometer using non-classical light not simple classical light like a laser, but non-classical light. And why did he do that? Because if you use non-classical light, you can improve the signal-to-noise ratio by decreasing the level of noise. And, and this is the result that was published uh, three years ago. And the green line is uh, the shot no the, the noise, sorry, the noise below the shot noise limit, which is the black line. It's slightly lower, but this makes a huge difference in terms of the event you can detect. And thanks to this improvement, many other events have been uh, detected since 2015. Uh, now, uh, five days ago, I was in California at a conference. Uh, they discussed also about that. And uh, they make an announcement. They are going to improve the kind of non-classical light that they're going to put in LIGO 
to even lower the noise and give us twice the universe we know now. Because they will lower the noise level so much that we will be able to explore twice the event that are now detectable using an interferometer. Okay, so we are solving a pretty simple practical problem, which is a noise problem. But of course, this has an impact also in basic research and in our understanding of the universe. Okay, so I show you three examples in which light, in which we use non-classical light, but it's non-classical light, pretty easy, no? I cannot describe it using classical electromagnetism. But actually, this is not just non-classical light, it's a particular kind of classical light, which is squeezing, squeeze the light. Okay, so let's try to understand what squeeze light, right? Okay, so what squeeze light? So Im imagine you have a laser. A laser is a classical light, or better, uh, it's called social quasi-classical state. Okay, it's still composed of photons, of course, but it can be described very well using classical electromagnetism. And this is a laser, uh, it's a monochromatic wave, it oscillates. This is the field which oscillate uh, depending on the phases, okay? And I can measure that, I can calculate expectation value of that. And you see all this gray area around the mean value of the field for each phase value. This is a noise. And this noise comes from, uh, it's called the zero photon noise or the uh, quantum noise limit, okay? Which comes from directly related to the uncertainty principle. Now, the Eisenberg uncertainty principle, though, doesn't tell us that we cannot measure a quantity with unlimited precision. But it tells us that if we measure a quantity with unlimited precision, well, the other quantity which does not commute with that quantity will be measured with a much less precision, completely undetermined, okay? And in this picture, the two operators that correspond to these uh, measurements are um, 90 degrees apart, which means that uh, if we have, for example, in the center where there are the arrow, a certain phase, okay, the corresponding quadrature operator will be at the peak or at the valley, okay? It's pi f shift. So I cannot measure those two points of the curve with a limited precision, but I can trade this precision. I can measure one with better precision and another with less. And how can I do that? Using squeeze light. So in squeeze light, the situation is like this. I have uh, a quadrature, which have very small uncertainty, as the one with the arrow, which is the so-called squeezing. Squeezing because it's like to squeeze my laser in one point. And of course, like in a balloon, if I squeeze a point, whoa, I will have the balloon expanding in the other point. And this is the, in, the, in the 90 degrees, you see, at pi f shift, we have anti-squeezing. So the un uh, uncertainty is larger. Now, squeezing is measured in uh, a unit that physicists do not use that much, but engineers do, so we, 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 we borrow that. So it's dB, okay? And, uh, and what is uh, squeezing in dB? So it's the ratio in dB between uh, not the uncertainty, but the variance, which is the, the, quarter, the, the square of the uncertainty. And so the squeezing of light is measured by the minimum uncertainty square that you can, divided by the zero photon limit or the uncertainty of the vacuum, which is the zero photon limit. Now, the world record, the world record ever measure of squeezing is 15 dB. And for the people that are not familiar with 15 dB, means that the ratio between the variances is 36. So the variance of the squeeze light is 36 smaller than the vacuum, which means that in that picture, the uncertainty on the right it's six times smaller than the uncertainty on the left. That is the war record, okay? Only six times, but it requires an immense amount of effort. We are pushing the quantum limit here, okay? Nothing is easy. Okay, great. Squeeze light is fantastic, but how can I generate squeeze light, right? You don't go to the grocery store, oh, give me a kilogram of squeeze light. No, you don't do that, okay? So how can I generate squeeze light? And you use a particular process, actually a few particular processes that are all based on nonlinear optics. And this is not a course that typically is taken by everybody, right? So I have to give you a one slide course in nonlinear optics, okay? Super condensed, a lecture in a lecture, right? Okay, 
easy. First, the displacement field is just epsilon naught e plus p, and p is the polarization. The polarization is the average dipole moment per unit volume, which is basically what? The dipole moment that I use in the bounded charges. The, the charges are bounded to the atom. The field arrives, it stretches the atom, and induces the dipole moment, right? And uh, in general, the response of an atom is very complicated. So p is a very complicated function. But physics is the art of approximation. Okay? It's, the, it's, not a, it's an exact science, but also the art of approximation. And so, if the field is not big enough, I can just uh, assume that I can expand, I can tailor expand this function this way. And I have linear optics. Okay? But if the field starts to become a little bit larger, uh, well, I have to include other terms. And this is no linear optics. And now you know no linear optics, and you can teach a course. OK, now, uh, of course, here, numbers matters. Even when you are a theoretical physicist, number matter. Because only quantitatively, you can say, oh, this is bigger than something else, and throw it away. Because this is what we always do. We throw away stuff. OK, so that we simplify our model. And uh, just to give you an idea about the value of chi 2 and chi 3, which are the uh, uh, response there, uh, gallium martin, which is a very strong nonlinear material, which possesses chi 2, it's 10 to the minus 10 meter per volt. So it means that you need the fields about 10 to the 5, 10 to the 4 volt per meter to start to see a little bit of nonlinearity. OK? And if you go to chi 3, it's even worse. You take a material where there is no second-order nonlinear response, but there is a third-order nonlinear response, that is silicon, OK? And this, oh, minus 19, OK? So we are getting a very, very tiny number here, OK? And that's why nonlinear optics is only 60, 60 years old. Why? Because uh, a few years earlier, people invented the laser. And with lasing, I can get electric field, which is sufficiently strong that they can see nonlinear optics. And of course, nonlinear optics, this is a kind of a classical picture, but there's also quantum nonlinear optics. This is what I do generally when I, when I don't teach, I do quantum nonlinear optics for research. Okay? And, uh, and quantum nonlinear optics, you can uh, generate with quantum nonlinear optics quiz light. And this is the idea. I take classical light, a laser, because I need a strong field. Laser is made of photons. And uh, the funny thing is that if I take a material with a sufficiently large nonlinear response, second-order nonlinear response, it turns out that my equation tells me that there is a certain probability that, this, that the single photon contained in my coherent state will split in two. And this splitting into this generation of pairs is actually the generation of squeezed vacuum light. And the process is uh, spontaneous, so I cannot, I can just hope it's going to happen, all right? And uh, it's called spontaneous parametric down conversion. And usually physicists do not choose uh, names randomly, OK? Spontaneous, OK, you know why. Parametric, because as any other parametric process, it preserves energy. And down conversion, because the two energies are smaller than the, the laser energy of the photon energy that I destroy, because obviously uh, the, the daughter photon, uh, the two energy, the sum together for the blue photon. Okay? And the arrows there are not drawn randomly. There is also momentum conservation I need to guarantee in order to observe this kind of phenomena. I can do it with chi 2 nonlinear material. And uh, in all the experiments that you have seen in um, before, in, that they show you before, they use a second order nonlinear attitude. But here, there are Kika students, right? You don't like easy things, right? You like tough things. So we are going to use chi tree. In chi tree, we have four fields, four fields, although it's chi tree, it's four fields. One is the polarization, the other three fields. Okay, so four fields. And you can imagine now that uh, two photons at a time that are completely uncorrelated, they interact inside a chi tree material, and pop, they emerge correlated, OK? And uh, same squeeze light, no difference, OK? There is no discrimination here, OK? And uh, this, uh, you can picture in your mind, uh, this like an elastic scattering of photons, 
okay? Because again, momentum and energy must be preserved. Now, picture it in your mind like this. And this uh, um, phenomenon is called spontaneous four-wave mixing. Spontaneous because, again, it's spontaneous. Four-wave mixing because there are four photons involved. Easy peasy. Okay, this is a nice story, but again, numbers are important. Okay, so let's try to make an experiment. And we take a third order nonlinear material, silicon, because kick us student, but we want to play easy here. <laughs> so we take a reasonably good nonlinear material. Uh, we take a laser, uh, we, we take a centimeter of this, we take a laser. We take a laser with a power that is the power of a laser pointer. We don't have a laser pointer here. It's not in the visible because silicon absorbs in the visible. So we take it at 15, 15 nanometer. And you don't need to be a KICA student to do the calculation. When you take one milliwatt at 15, 50, this corresponds to a flux of 10 to the 16 photons per second. 10 to the 16 photons per second. Seems astrophysics here, okay? Okay, so in nonlinear optics, you know, we need a very large electric field amplitude. And uh, the electric field amplitude square is the intensity, okay? So in order to increase the intensity of a laser beam, we need to focus it. And so we will also focus this beam on a very tiny area, 10 microns times 10 microns. Very difficult to do that, possible. Very difficult to keep the focus per centimeter, almost impossible. But guys, give me a break and we'll do it. Let's assume I can do that, okay? So I am uh, I'm kind here with hypothesis. I do my calculation. This is what I do for a living. And uh, drum roll. Let's see how much, uh, how, how many photon pairs I get. Oh, that's fantastic audience. That's, and, whoa. 50 pairs! Well, this is not a great investment, you know, even with uh, Wall Street plunging. I mean, it's 10 to the 16 photons I gave here, and I get 50 pairs. And of course, uh, there are many, there are strong lights here, but I'm sure there was someone like this. I'm sure that one of you was, oh, what's going on here? Okay, just 50 pairs. So these are the problems I was mentioning you, right? And uh, whew, it's a long tunnel. So let's see if there is light at the end of the tunnel, because obviously it's never going to work this way. OK? Too much power, too much power in it. So I have to find a solution. And luckily, there are many solutions. And the first solution I'm going to propose to you is what I call the particle physicist approach solution. And, uh, and we have seen about particle physicists. I mean, this talk. I promise, I didn't know what was the, the, the surprise eh, of Planck's, so, okay? Particle physicist, you know particle physicists. If you know particle physicists, they think big. Very big, you know, the big third, slack, you know? For example, think about neutrinos. Think about neutrinos, okay? I want to detect neutrinos. But neutrinos interact very, very gently with matter. Okay, so it's more probability to get an interaction with neutrino. What do I do? I take typically water, and when neutrino interact with water, it emits serine cove radiation. So if I can detect serine cove radiation, I can detect neutrinos. But of course, the probability is very tiny. But particle physicists think big, right? And so what do they do? Well, they take a mine, they fill it with water, they cover it with photodetector, and they do super chemical can experiment. I, di I did another surprise, huh? but uh, it's also... so it's it's a local causality that was violated in this talk. So now, and of course, that's the solution. So small probability to get an event. I take a lot of uh, water, and I will get an event. Why did I think about it? It's just enough to take a big crystal. <laughs> Whew. That's crazy. Obviously, you're laughing, right? It has been done. I'm not kidding. It has been done. In 2005, they even played with a material with smaller nonlinearity, it was silica. The nonlinearity is 10 times smaller than silicon. But they, take, they took an optical fiber. Instead of taking a centimeter, they take hundreds of meters. And light interacts hundreds of meters. This is like super chemical experiment. 
for spontaneous flow mixing. And they got pairs. They got a lot of pairs, kind of a million pairs per second. So this is the solution for the particle physicist approach. But there is also another solution. I'm going to talk multiply about this solution. It's called the elevator approach. Hmm. Elevator approach. Let me think about it. So this is the way I teach it to my students. Okay? So imagine you have two people in an elevator, right? And uh, you can ask a question. Well, what's the probability they're going to interact? Hmm? Well, we can say something about that probability. No matter how these two people, whether they, go, they get along nicely or not, or the probability they're going to interact is inversely proportional to the time they spend in the elevator, and, sorry, directly proportional to the time, the time they spend in the elevator, and inversely proportional to the size of the elevator. If I take a four meter square elevator and I stack them for four hours, I can tell you they will interact. Okay? Now, stop thinking about the interaction now, okay? Anyway, so imagine that there is matter by that light, okay? Well, I just have to find an elevator for light and matter. And then I'm done. It turns out there are at least two kinds of elevator. Now, the first time, the first kind of elevator are waveguides. Waveguides. Similar to the fiber, actually. Okay? And um, the size of the elevator is the, the cross section of the waveguide. And the time that lies spanning the waveguide is proportional to the length divided by the groove velocity. Okay? This is kind of our elevator, which is not very tiny in the longitudinal direction, but it's very tiny in uh, the transverse direction. But then the reason, there are resonators. Oh, resonators are basically elevators, okay? I take mirrors and I trap light inside. And uh, I can trap them for a certain time on a certain length. And the intensity of the field that I get that, the intensity of the field is in fact, is in fact uh, directly proportional to tau divided by L. We're going to talk about a particular kind of elevator, which is uh, ring resonators. Okay, they, they, they wrote books about it, like you probably heard about Lord of the Rings, right? It's about a ring resonator. And uh, there is uh, light coming into the resonator. We arrive at the coupling point, and the light will split. Part will go straight, and part will go around. And the two beams will meet right after the coupling point, okay? Now, the one that went in the room, ring uh, undergoes... Uh, this kind of phase shift is uh, omega divided by C and L. Omega divided by C and is the wave vector times L. So it goes around, it acquires a certain phase. Plus pi, that pi comes from the fact that the photons cross the coupling point twice. Every time that you cross the coupling point, you get a pi half phase, and then you go back another pi, half pi phase, and so you get pi phase. The one in the channel doesn't get any. It's just right after the coupling point, so there's no dephase in there. So they meet together, and uh, when uh, the phase difference is equal to a hard multiple of pi, you know what happens. Destructive interference. And so, it's, so the photons that will want to exit see the destructive interference, and it stays inside. It goes around for a certain amount. And this won't happen to any frequency, of course, because you need to satisfy that equation. And when you put inside this, you get that there will be a comb of equally spaced resonances where the spacing is inversely proportional to the length okay, of the, of, the, of the round trip. And you get something like this. If you go to look at the intensity of the field inside the ring resonator, you get spikes at these resonances. Okay, so I can take this elevator. Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, the dwelling time, so the time that lies spent in the elevator, is precisely the inverse of the line width. It's precise. It's not proportional. It's precisely the inverse of the line width. And the, the peak will be proportional, in this case, to tau divided by v, exactly like in the elevator. Okay? So, what you can do? You can take a real ring now. This is a, a ring of silicon, 5 micron radius. So it's a tiny ring, okay? 5 microns, okay? Ready? And you can inject now, again, the same amount, the same amount of photon as before. And now I get 10 to the 6 pairs per second. 
It's a lot. It's a lot because I didn't use a centimeter of silicon. Okay, I use only 36 microns because it's 2 pi r. Okay. Now this has been done experimentally. And this has been done, in fact, in Italy, uh, in Pavia, a few uh, ten, 10 years ago. I know the people who did that. This is the original uh, result. Uh, this, the, the intensity you can see the pump in the middle, very strong, and then these two signals, which are given on the on the camera uh, by the photons that arrive together. Okay. And this corresponds, when you do your math, to eight orders of magnitude of enhancement of light matter interaction. We're going astrophysics here, okay? So it can be done very efficiently in a tiny little, little object. Now, and this is because, again, the polarization, the nonlinear response depends on a certain product of fields. So if I enhance uh, 10 times the field, the third order nonlinear response will be enhanced a thousand times because it's nonlinear in the field. And uh, you can play with different structure. This is a particular structure that we investigated with Xanadu quantum technologies a few years ago, only a couple of years ago. We call it snowman because it looks like a snowman. Okay, and we use that to generate squeezing, and we measure eight dB squeezing. You remember the world record? done in an experiment that is huge. It's, uh, uh, it's 15 dB. Here it's 8 dB, and it's in a thing that you can barely see. Okay? 8 dB uh, correspond now to um, a ratio of variances of about 6, which means uh, that the uncertainty is reduced to 0.5 on the measurements of the field. Okay, so people now constantly look for new elevators. New elevators for light. And these are just a few examples, okay? This is an exciting period of history because not only we can imagine this kind of elevators, but we can use interference to confine light in tiny little space and we can increase tremendously the light matter interaction and observing quantum phenomena that couldn't be explored before. And they require an immense amount of calculation and theoretical physics to do that and to describe these things. So, if you want to play with light and matter, and you want to go big, start thinking small. Not particle physicist, small. Option number two, elevator. Okay, so, where are we going with all of this? Where are we going? So, in uh, 2020, we have the experiment of Jiang Wei Pan. It's a big experiment. It's bigger than this stage here. Okay, and then uh, in uh, two years later, a commercial company is starting to use this to build a quantum computer. Okay, this, unlike, uh, uh, to be fair, unlike uh, the IBM quantum computer, there is a big difference here. This computer is not universal. I cannot ask to do what it wants. It solves very efficiently some kind of problems, not all problems. Building a universal quantum computer is more difficult, okay? And, uh, and Xanadu is working on that. It's working on that. And uh, one year later than that experiment, they proposed a platform that a chip like this, okay, that you can see the sketch here, where uh, you generate light inside, okay, and uh, you generate squeezing and you make interfere. This is actually an experiment they did and they published, so it's not just uh, sci fiction, okay? Uh, but they didn't reach quantum advantage yet, okay? They need to do a little bit more squeezing to get quantum advantage, but this is on the way. Okay, so we arrived, we arrived at uh, the moment of some take home messages, some spotlights. And um, so, first of all, we are at a turning point in history, okay? So, despite uh, this uh, object on the right seems very advanced, okay? They are pretty much like uh, the ENIAC in the 60s, okay? We're still uh, at the basic research level, okay? At that time, in that black and white picture, that was the best you can find there, eh? it was advanced technology at that time, okay? 
Uh, now we have the cutting edge technology on the right. It's more fancy. We have colors now for the pictures. But we are still at the basic level. And yet we are at a turning point because for the first time we are able to exploit quantum physics for solving practical problems. This is very important because this will help and feed a lot of investment because uh, even if we are theorists, I can tell you that to do good physics, you need money as well, not just a piece of paper. We are lucky, and the people who do theoretical work, Caesar, okay, an experimentalist. But if you want to go on and on and on, you need also the experiments, because then from the experiment, there will be unexpected events, and then uh, the experimentalist will go to the theoretical physicist, oh, look, I saw this, okay, what's going on here? And uh, we will construct new theories. Another important point is that uh, you can really play with what you want. Physics will play a, a crucial role, quantum physics in particular, but not only, as you can see here, I like playing with light, but of course this is a matter of taste, really, you know? You love atom, sure, no problem, atoms are quantum, you can do that. You love superconductors and other particular, more complicated material, great, you can exploit that for quantum technologies, okay? And of course, with this comes an immense amount of fascinating theories that can be developed in models, okay? Try to describe these very complex systems in a very nice and usable way. And uh, another important point is that many countries are investing in this direction. And I tell you this because, uh, uh, because you are at the beginning of your career, you hopefully want to work in a research center or in a company or in a university. And uh, uh, this is, for example, an initiative that Italy have just started. It's the National Quantum Science and Technology Institute. They want to go from quantum research to industries. Um, feeding also, of course, international programs, trying to, to stimulate new companies and new startups, like Sanadu, for example, was when, when, when they started, there were 10, 15 people. Now, I, I, I don't know them all any, anymore because there are more than 150 people, okay? And, uh, and similar, similar action have been uh, um, started in many countries. In the United States, there is uh, the Quantum Initiative. Uh, uh, in uh, French, uh, there are also um, uh, initiatives like that. Uh, in UK, a lot, and so on and so on. So there is hope uh, that this will be exciting for the next uh, uh, few years, and it's very important to not lose the opportunities. And finally, I think that I convince you with this little lecture that the future of quantum technology is bright. After all, light is the only vector of quantum information that I can use for all the quantum technologies, okay? Um, not obvious that uh, uh, will be the best solution for all the problem, but certainly it's very interesting, and, uh, and we have a lot of fun exploring light for these technologies. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention and also thank the organizer for the fantastic uh, opportunity. I mean, I, I, I was like Bob when I saw the crystal. The uh, yeah, pictures, uh, I was like, banana! I was banana like, that's <laughs> right, banana! That's right. Okay, as always... Questions. Yeah. yeah, as always, we have room for some questions. <clears throat> From the backstage, can you switch on? Does it on work? The, yeah. It does work. Thank you. First of all, Thank you for such an inspiring and interesting lecture. You were quite energizing to the audience. So I was interested um, in one particular thing. When you were shown on the slides that one particular example about the quantum advantage in some, something that we can do with this technology, but not with the classical computers, when do we know, how do we determine what's the cutoff between what is classically great and quantum great. How do you determine this quantum advantage? Because as you know, besides this quantum improvement of quantum computing, there's also improvement in classical computing. So things that could take 2.5 billion years now could take 2.5 years, maybe in a few years. Okay, thank you. This is an excellent question. So, 
Certainly, uh, it's a kind of a race, in fact. So uh, proving quantum advantages would be, it would have been much more easier uh, 20 years ago because the computer was slow, right? So you could, obviously. Now, there are, though, some, uh, and, and this is mainly a matter of, uh, uh, for theorists, in fact. So it depends on the class of problems. The, in the sense that um, there are some problems, for example, those that uh, uh, belong to the MP-hard problems, right? In this case, uh, resources scale exponentially with the size of the problem. And... Uh, when you take them with a classical approach. And this is mathematically demonstrated. So the problem, in fact, sometimes is finding the problems that you know that will become easily unpractical for any classical computer, even in the future, because uh, um, you will be able to scale exponentially. So suppose uh, that... Uh, uh, now we, we find a computer that can solve these, uh, uh, this problem for 100 waveguides. I can just take 120 and immediately I will have to build a new technology, okay? So um, an important point here is that uh, um, quantum advantage, in, in other cases though, quantum advantage is easier. For example, for what concern with quantum cryptography? Well, quantum advantage is because, of course, I'm using quantum physics, and there there is no classical example that you can provide you the security, okay? Now, for what concern computation, though, quantum advantage is not the only, the only thing. What matters is the resources you use. Because even if you build a quantum computer, even if you don't prove quantum advantage, for example, with IBM, you can solve problems with much less energy than you would use a classical one. Not that you cannot solve it with a classical one in maybe 10 times the, 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 the time, but the problem is that you will use much more energy. And this is important also for environment, because, uh, of course, if I solve something efficiently, I will increase the entropy of the planet much less. Okay? So, but yours is a very good point. When do I know quantum advantage? This is really a mathematical problem. So we know that there are some classes of problems in which it's easier to see the, the, the advantage. And in fact, the, the, the boson sampling and the Gaussian boson sampling I saw you were, were initially proposed and for, for light because we knew that it would have been easy to reach this, get this advantage quickly. I hope I answer your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the talk. One question that I have related to the uh, the numerous numbers you have shown in the presentation. So I guess in this field, lots of people show um, uh, show how much they can improve in terms of squeezing compared to uh, see the non squeeze light. Uh, but my question is how reproducible these numbers are. Uh, and I guess this is quite important if we are talking about practical applications. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the question. This is a very important question. Uh, it turns out they are very, very reproducible. These are not tough experiments anymore. So even with the ring uh, uh, structure that I mentioned you, now the technology allows us to, to uh, fabricate this ring with a sufficient precision such that if I'm going to take 10 rings, I will observe the same number, eight of 10, okay? And this, of course, as technology improves, we will go basically nearly 99%. So we are at a level in which uh, uh, these results are very, very reproducible. The problem is not uh, uh, the reproducibility, but the scalability, but the scalability, uh, because uh, I will need many squeezers to, to, to realize the quantum computer that Xanadu uh, suggested. There are other... Um, there are other uh, approaches in which you use much less squeezers, but uh, you need much more squeezing. So beyond uh, 10, uh, 12, or even the rake of 15 dBs. And in that case, uh, reproducibility uh, is important just at the level of the single device. Okay? But when, uh, when people uh, show you these results, uh, nine, if they're serious people, like the colleagues I work with, it's because... Uh, we can reproduce them and relatively easily. Okay, it's not just once in a while. So the reproducibility, 
I don't think it's, it's a concern, it's more a concern of the scalability. first hello thank you thanks extremely interesting talk um, I, I was wondering maybe it's like a, a basic question so I, I don't really understand um, your definition of uh, light with quantum properties I would have assumed um, okay what is classical light it's basically if, if I have lots of photons and then they're in a coherent state and I would have assumed this is classical light and if I have, I don't know, one photon, I would say it's like quantum light. But you're talking about squeezing and by that making light with quantum properties. And you also showed like field amplitudes. So I would, I, it seems to me it's like there are lots of photons yeah. with quantum properties. But my question is basically why? What are the quantum properties? Maybe from, from oh, maybe yeah. you can pull up the slide with the squeeze. I don't know, but yeah, that's basically my question. Yeah, so uh, that's a that's a very interesting question. In fact, so first of all, first of all, we have these um, probably it's because we start with atoms. We have this idea that quantum properties are connected to they're very elusive, difficult to observe, associated with small objects, but it's not. If you think about a, a superconductor, it's a big chunk of material, but the result is really a quantum result, right? Now, <clears throat> even with light, it's the, the quantum, so first of all, how you I define on classical light? So I define on classical light any time that by measuring this light, I obtain a result that there is no way I can explain using classical electromagnetism. And in the case of squeezing, there is no way I can uh, explain why I have uh, uh, as, as a certain reduction of the noise, right, in a point and a limited noise on the other. So there's no possible to explain that with, with things. And of course, as you pointed out, the squeeze light contains many photons. In fact, as, uh, it contains, there are hundreds of photons, for example, in a 15 dB squeeze light. The, 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 uh, the quantum nature of this, uh, of this field comes from the fact that the photons are correlated pairs by pairs. If you think about it, it's not different from superconductivity, you know? There are Cooper pairs, right? There are many of them, but they are pairs, okay? And, and this gives this unusual behavior in the superconductivity because there is a photon-photon, a pair-pair -photon, correlation, an electron-electron correlation. In this case, it's a photon-photon correlation. Now, then of course, um, when we talk about quantum and classical, sometimes these terms are a little bit abused in the sense that the experiment, it's an experiment. It's neither quantum or classical. There's no such thing as a quantum experiment or a classical experiment. What is quantum or classical is the theory. So uh, I have a, an experiment, and if I say, oh, look, I have to take a quantum theory to explain it, usually say is a quantum experiment, okay? And of course, uh, you can see also in this, if you remember the slides, because even in a, in a, in a classical, what, what I call classical fields, at a certain moment I used, uh, uh, I was more precise, say quasi-classical, but of course, of course, even in a laser, there are photons, which, is, which are quantum particles, obviously. But the point is that uh, unless, uh, uh, unless I go and see and count the fact that the photon is, uh, that the laser light is composed of photons, I can describe all the other experiments without requiring quantization, okay? And that's why we talk about uh, classical fields or quasi-classical, okay? So, um, yeah, I think I answered more or less the question. So, okay, so you're saying the squeeze light consists of pairs? Like, or pairs many of pairs, photons. but yeah. the point is that there are photon-photon correlation, and then I have hundreds of these photon-photon correlation. So we have a collective uh, effect of photon photon that are that are linked together. And you you do your computation with the squeezed light, like in the thing you've shown in the yeah. in the computer itself. Yes, so correct. One qubit is like I don't know. Uh, it's of... not yeah. So it's not one qubit. This is not an approach based on qubit. This is based on so, on so called continuous variable. As you can imagine, that this is analog computing. It's not digital computing. In fact. It's kind of an analog computing, if you want. Then, of course, ultimately, what you're going to do, you're going to 
count the photons, so you will discretize, okay? But you don't, um, it's very difficult to identify one-to-one uh, -one correspondence in terms of qubits between continuous variable and, and qubits, like, for example, in the IBM computer. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I also want to thank you for the inspiring and uh, very motivating talk. Um, and I have one question regarding the decoherence time. You said that uh, the advantage of using photonics is a very long decoherence time. Um, for if we have bigger quantum programs, it will probably be needed to have quantum memory. Would that also be an application for photonics? And could you like store it in a resonator? in a fixed quantum state. OK, so the question is about uh, decoherence and memories, so two different things. So decoherence, we have to consider that uh, uh, if I take photons and, uh, and they do not interact with matter, even at room temperature, they will maintain their quantum properties. While uh, the problem uh, with electrons or superconductor is that I need to isolate or keep them uh, very cold. Otherwise, they will interact with the environment. And of course, uh, if you take uh, an entangled state and you trace over one of the subsystems, you will get a mixed state and we will lose the coherence, right? And so for light, this is much difficult to, um, to observe because light doesn't like to interact that much with the environment. So, so that's the, the, the coherence time. The memory, but of course, uh, a problem with light is that uh, when, when, when light travels, sometimes photons are scattered away. And this is the main issue with light, that it's very, uh, difficult to prevent uh, at the single photon level all the scattering events. Uh, you can also play with memories. Uh, you can use ring resonator to play with memories. Uh, there are some uh, limitations. Uh, you, uh, you need to open and close this uh, coupling point uh, very, very fast. People are working on that. They will probably use not a small ring because light travels very fast. They use a ring made of optical fibers. But this is, in fact, an approach that people are trying to, to use to create a quantum memory. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. And what times of memory would you be able to use? Is it still only for short programs? Or could you like pro uh, do quantum programs that run over multiple days and store the Multiple days, oh. I think that for the moment, uh, if you can uh, store a photon for a nanosecond, it's a lot. OK. Light travel very fast. OK. Yep. Thank you very much. OK, we are done with the questions. And you can write me if you want, if you have more questions. Yeah, thank you, thank Professor, you for the really nice talk. But I, I think, no, 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 please. Please, 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 we have a gift for you. Oof. Luca, Valentina. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. That's, uh, super. Oh, what's this? A tie, you know? Let's, let's open it. It's a squeezer. Whoa, that's spent. That is amazing, and we'll find a fantastic place in my office. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> I really, I'm really honored of that. Thank you very much. You it's a what? fantastic idea. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for this fantastic uh, response. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Okay.